An unusual pile of bags is found on the side of a road. The overwhelming stench warns the cyclist of what he is about to discover. This homicide case would be a constant battle for police, but the results would go down as a major chapter in forensic history. Generally, one, possibly two weapons are used. To have three weapons used is quite unusual. Frustration levels at this stage were very high. We needed to make this girl come alive. There seemed to be a lot of animal hairs present. I had one of those rare moments which could be described as a CSI moment. If you're innocent, you don't have to convince yourself. But you can't go out to someone and say, excuse me, is your son involved in a horrific murder? And he rang back and said, look, I've got some bad news. It's not him. I showed a photograph to a barmaid, and she says, he's Australian, isn't he? There's still a family out there that somewhere have lost their daughter or, or wife. The woman found wrapped in garbage bags on the side of this road had been the victim of a brutal murder. But there was no identification on her body. And like the name of the street where she was found, her identity would keep police guessing for many months to come. When we arrived, the scene was very well contained by the local police who did an excellent job. Uh, it's a light industrial area. And it was very apparent because of the nature of the fact that she'd been wrapped in plastic and the body was dumped at the side of the road, that this was a secondary crime scene and obviously not where she'd been killed. The body was in the early stages of decomposition. The legs were bent at the knees with the feet beneath the buttocks. There was blood staining to her head and to the front of her top. There was an obvious gash on the top of her head and we were aware that there was something in the mouth. It looked like paper, but at that stage it was really just a case of working out what was there. There was an obvious ligature around the throat. The victim had short dark hair and a medium build. She was dressed in a white bodysuit and black and white shorts. There is no other form of identification on her at all, apart from a gold wedding ring on her right hand and a black leather watch on her left wrist. So there wasn't a lot at the scene that would actually help us in identification at that point. In fact, we did searches up and down the street and adjacent streets with the view of trying to find a purse or some identification that might have been dumped in concert with the body. Nothing transpired from those searches. The body weighed 62 kilograms. She was 1.61 metres tall, about 5'1", 5'2". She looked fit. No needle track marks, no tattoos. In general terms, she looked like the person next door. It became obvious that neck compression was the most likely cause of death. There certainly was evidence of a blow to the head as well, but that probably only caused incapacitation, followed by the actual ligature strangulation. One of the things that was noted at the location was that there was the presence of a large amount of newspaper in her mouth. This obstructed her airway and it would have led to her suffocating. The pathologist removed the newspaper from the deceased's mouth and it was two full-size sheets of the Sydney Morning Herald dated the 10th of December 1991. We were very conscious that this might be a valuable piece of evidence for us and it was secured by the crime scene officers for fingerprint examination. The date on the newspaper indicated that the victim had to have been murdered after that time. But the decomposition and maggots taken from her body suggested it was much sooner. With the entomology, it actually gave us a window that actually was late in the evening of the 23rd of December and early in the morning on the 25th, which covers Christmas Day. You'd think if, if somebody is going to go missing in that time, that would be when you'd actually miss them. So we were fairly confident that we had a fairly straightforward murder. If we could identify this girl relatively quickly, 
we would then be able to identify the offender because most people are actually killed by people that know them. An autopsy has revealed the woman, aged in her mid-twenties, was murdered three to five days ago. This watch offers the best hope for identifying the victim and solving the murder mystery. It was really a case of putting out to the media and then just waiting for the results to come in. Police say it appears the young woman was murdered elsewhere. As the nightly news pleaded for public help in the identification of the victim, the newspaper from her mouth was yielding its own results. This slimy exhibit turned up one morning, a wad of newspaper the size of a man's fist that they removed from a throat. It was opened with gloved hands and as it unfolded, right dead smack in the centre, we all spotted three fingerprint patterns. There were three distinct tips of fingers, one slightly higher than the rest. It was an exciting, it was a fingerprint jackpot to us all. We believed that we might have had a, an unprecedented case. It looked like we might have the killer before we can even identify the victim. Police were yet to identify the body of a woman who had been dumped in a suburban street. They were calling her Jane Doe. They believed that her killer had left behind a vital clue. Three fingerprints that appeared to be in her blood on a newspaper stuffed in her throat. I had one of those rare moments where you have this almost flashback of what would have happened during the commission of the crime with the newspaper being pushed down into the mouth and leaving that fingerprint there. First of all, we photographed the fingerprint in situ many times from different angles to capture everything we had. After that, we tried to enhance it with an anhydrin, which darkens it a little, and maybe we could pick up another ridge or two. After that, the best fingerprint image that we have now of that left middle finger is then fed into the computer. It just kept coming up as a blank. The suggestion was that this person hadn't been arrested previously, which, which is not unusual because in most murder inquiries, usually the victim is killed by somebody they know, and often as not, those people don't come under the notice of police. It was very disappointing, but our hopes were still high. We may identify the victim from another means. She must have lived somewhere. And a killer may not be on record now, but boy, he's going to come on record sooner or later with uh, actions like that, isn't he? What we had was the clothing she had, the injuries she sustained to her, her body, limited jewellery, some small amounts of hairs and, and sand that they'd found to the post-mortem. And that was about it at, at that stage. I received some hair samples recovered from the victim's clothing. And when I looked at the sample, there seemed to be a lot of animal hairs present. And when I looked at these hairs under the microscope, I could then confirm they were animal hairs because their internal hair structure was different to the appearance of a human hair. The medulla, which is the central structure that runs through the hair strand, is much wider in an animal hair than a human hair. That was quite significant as far as I was concerned. I had the inclination that there were dog hairs, and when I examined them under the microscope, obviously that uh, was the proof that they clearly were dog hairs. It then was the matter of working out possibly what type of breed it could be. I declared eventually that the hairs came from an Alsatian or from a German Shepherd. The reality was that uh, we needed to identify, again, the victim, to identify the offender, to identify the dog, and, the, and that would actually be a piece of support evidence down the track. Because we had this sand on the body, and the area is a beachside area, it struck us that it was a strong possibility she was a local. So we dressed up a policewoman in the same clothing, and she was approximately the same size, build and age, and we walked her down the beach and along various locations. 
We also took the store dummy down to a number of railway stations in a hope of actually attracting attention. The notion there was to actually appeal very much to that local area, to identifying the victim to the area. We also focused on the fact that there was a park down the road where a fairground had been set up. So we very quickly concentrated on that and also concentrated on the fairground staff as itinerants. She may have been somebody who worked at the fairground because they do attract uh, itinerant workers, or alternatively, she is a local that's actually visited the fair that day. So we, we looked at both possibilities when we went down there. But there were no strong leads. With only the clothes she was wearing to spark a memory, it was difficult for the investigators to move forward. We needed to make this girl come alive. We wanted people to actually empathise with her and we wanted people to actually go out of their way to think about her. We set about very quickly designing ways to actually do that. We had a number of photographs from the morgue that we took. We looked at trying to digitally enhance the face. We took out all the, the insect infestation on the face. We actually then had to do some guesswork as to what her eyes would look like open. We went through various hairstyles, some longer, some shorter, to align it with the face, then with the eyes, and then you get into a jawline, and then into skin colouring, because our girl had been in a state of decomposition. I've got to admit, we actually did get a lot of very good results in terms of feedback from the community on it. Unfortunately, as, as with most things, it didn't get us the identification of the victim at that point. By this stage, I think we're up to about the second or third week, and uh, I've got to admit that frustration levels at this stage were very high. Since the discovery of the woman's body a month ago, police have been sifting through masses of missing person files, trying to make a positive identification. My role was firstly to go through the hundreds of missing person reports that we had. I couldn't tell you the figures nowadays, but the amount of girls that we went through just files, like hundreds and hundreds, so that was lengthy but it was also good because we actually found girls that had been missing and got them to phone home to mum and dad. So that was one good thing to come out of it, but it didn't help us. There's still a family out there that somewhere have lost their daughter or, or wife. With the Jane Doe story disappearing from the newspapers, a last ditch effort was made with a magazine to help solve the murder mystery. We had the advantage with the women's magazines of having these photos in color. That would actually bring a dimension to the photographs that we hadn't had before in the newspapers. And in fact, we actually released a photo that was a three-quarter trunk shot, so that we actually had the clothing. And the notion was that those that actually had an interest in it would then say, yes, well, I now remember that top, because there's this link between that photograph and my memory of your sister, your cousin, your aunt, whatever the case may be. We got a call from a girl who claimed to know her. And she actually then came into our office where she could view our photographs of what we had of the Seiko watch and also the ring and the clothing. She was pretty sure that it was her friend, Vivian. Not 100%, but 90% sure. She knew Vivian as a dancer at the King's Cross area in a number of the clubs up there. So we had a person saying, this is Vivian. What we needed was fingerprints or dental to say who it was. And what we required was to obtain some material, preferably paper, cards, receipts, letters, that she may have handled. The witness had told police that Vivian had rented a place in King's Cross. From the lease, they now had her full name and fingerprints that matched those taken from the deceased at the autopsy. Well, it just means she touched that piece of paper, but we still need positive identification and the only way we had now was to obtain dental records. And those dental records were eventually obtained and a dental comparison was carried out and Vivian was positively identified. Vivian always worked as a dancer and she'd set her sights on going overseas and to earn the money to go overseas, she, she did work as a prostitute, but she was quite ambitious not to do that into the future. The thing that had complicated the whole process to begin with was that Vivian had told a number of her friends that she'd planned to go overseas with her boyfriend over the Christmas period and travel Europe for several months. So these factors were the things that actually explained why we weren't able to identify Vivian as quickly as we'd liked. Police identified the boyfriend as Richard White, 
whose name also appeared on the lease. He was described as a person who was into bodybuilding. The witness believed he took steroids. He did take uh, speed and amphetamine, and he dealt casually in amphetamine. From the descriptions, he was quite a massive fellow who was very much into the scene at King's Cross. She also described him as somebody who was probably free with his fists when uh, dealing with Vivian if they'd had a fight. So the mystery of Jane Doe's identity had been solved. But where was Richard White? More importantly, was it his fingerprint on the newspaper found in Vivian's throat? She had been known as Jane Doe for nearly four months. But then the murder victim who had been found wrapped in plastic garbage bags was identified as Vivian Ruiz, a dancer and part-time prostitute who was saving money to go overseas with her boyfriend. They were quite active in the social scene at King's Cross and at some stages they actually did have physical arguments when they were out in that um, he would strike her or she would strike him. It was quite a volatile relationship sometimes when they were out socialising with their friends. My understanding of the relationship between White and Ruiz was it was quite fiery and that it was uh, very much uh, a hot and cold relationship. As I understand it, White actually had a preference for hanging around with prostitutes and it turned him on talking about sex on a regular basis. We knew that Vivian had spoken to her friends and had plans to travel with Richard over the Christmas period. So what we tried to find was where are her tickets, where is her money gone? They've been working and she's been making lots of money according to her friends. There's going to be money, there's going to be tickets somewhere. We found the travel agent up at King's Cross where both Vivian and Richard had booked tickets for this overseas trip. Interestingly enough, Richard, on the 27th of December, had arranged for these tickets to be cancelled and for the money to be sent to his parents' place. That struck her as odd, at the, uh, the, the witness of the travel agent, because of the fact they'd paid for them separately and because there'd been this insistence on paying for them separately. The 27th of December appeared to be a busy day for Richard. On that day, the first business day after Christmas, and the time police believed Vivian was murdered, Richard had visited his bank. We were aware from our inquiries that Vivian had a shoebox that she collected her money in. Uh, she had a distrust of banks, as I understand it. And interestingly enough, Richard had banked a significant amount of money on the 27th of December, which we can't account for as to where he obtained that money. So I've got this name, Richard White. The first thing to do is to get on the computer to check to see if he's got a criminal history. Now, that's unlikely or well, at least at that stage I assumed it was unlikely because we'd run this fingerprint through the system. If Richard White did have a record, then his fingerprints should have popped up when the fingerprint found on the newspaper was fed into the police database. But the record comes back showing that he's got a, a history of an assault and uh, a drink driving matter. So I ring our fingerprint expert and we give him the name. and. Like I said, at this stage, I'm a little bit curious as to why it hasn't come up if we've done the fingerprint checks before. And I remember he said, look, leave it with me. And he went off to do the search, rang back and said, look, I've got some bad news, it's not him. What we couldn't understand is that we finally identified the girl and hopefully it would all fall into place with the, the killer as well, with that fingerprint being on the newspaper. To be told that it wasn't a match was just like, how could it not be? Cole said, look, there's something about this print that's not right. It looks like it should fit. You know, there are patterns in it that look like they actually are similar to what uh, this fellow has as a fingerprint on record. So I said, look, leave it with me, I'll talk to somebody. A gut instinct told detectives that Richard White was their man. So while the fingerprint section continued their examination of his prints, nothing was released to the public about Jane Doe's identity. Well, we wanted to keep her identity out of the media at this stage simply because we didn't know where Richard White was. And there was a strong possibility that he could escape the net by going overseas to a country without extradition process for us. So we were very conscious of that. And we were also aware that uh, they had planned a trip overseas, so he had the means to do that if he had not already travelled overseas. There was also the thinking that, look, if he had a co-offender and he had evidence still here that might convict him, it would be relatively easy to destroy it before we could actually get to it. So 
the notion was to identify his whereabouts and identify all the likely areas where there was evidence before actually making this public. From the lease of Vivian's unit, we had Richard's full name and an address for him that we'd worked out from our inquiries that was his parents' home. What we needed to do was just speak to the parents, but you can't go out to someone and say, excuse me, is your son involved in a horrific murder? Michael thought the idea of just sending out one of the local traffic police to inquire if Richard was around in relation to a traffic incident. Just keep it nice and innocent that way you're not going to alert Richard if he does need to be spoken to by us. The traffic sergeant did a really good job in establishing that uh, Richard had in fact left the country on the 2nd of January and had flown to Bangkok. Probably the other significant thing that the traffic sergeant was able to tell us is that the family actually had a German shepherd. So we, we had a couple of pieces of evidence there that we could see starting to fall into place. Beautiful dog. From the inquiries that the local police officer did for us going to the parents' house, we found out that Richard had a vehicle or a van that he'd sold. So then we knew a van that we then had to track down to see when he'd sold it, was it used around Christmas, and is it of any purpose to our investigation? We were extremely lucky in that the new owner had never washed the van and had not cleaned out what was an old carpet that he'd kept in the back. It had a stain on it, but it had been treated in some fashion with chemicals, thinners or some other item from uh, Richard's French polishing trade. It looked very deliberate that he, he disguised this spill by pouring a chemical over it. It indicated that something had been trying to be covered up. It's like whitewashing uh, graffiti of a wall. The crime scene investigator observed that on the underside of the mat there were some areas where there was underfilt. And in one of those areas, he saw a dark stain, which appeared to be blood. He also examined the gearbox cover in the vehicle and observed dark brown staining to that area. He carried out a presumptive test for blood on that stain, which gave a very quick positive reaction. So we were pretty confident we'd found the vehicle that had actually transported that body. I might add too that the van and the carpet still had trace hairs from uh, a German shepherd. But there was still a question of the fingerprint. In most homicides, the victim knows their killer. When Jane Doe was identified as Vivian Ruiz, the obvious suspect was her sparring partner and boyfriend, Richard White. It was a surprise then that his fingerprints didn't match those on the newspaper stuffed down her throat. But the detectives weren't giving up, nor were the fingerprint experts. He brought it to me and we checked it together and I said, pictorially, it's a perfect J-loop, absolute match. Go back and reverse it. What Barry Fay was asking for was a negative image to be made of Richard White's fingerprint. And when it was done, it perfectly fitted the fingerprint found on the newspaper. We call it a tonal reverse. It's not the ridges that we're looking at here, we're looking at the valleys. So the fingerprint black lines were in fact the grooves between each papillary ridge. And when we first saw those three blood-like fingerprints on the newspaper, we theorised that the killer blood all over his hands. He finds the newspaper nearby and grabs her. The grabbing action takes all the blood off the tops of the ridges, but the valleys in between are still damp. And then he starts pushing it down the throat. He makes that last desperate thrust with those three fingers to get it as far down the throat as he can. The valleys of the fingerprint come forward now under pressure and transfer the fingerprint pattern. Then as he pulls his hand out, the paper closes around it and he may have then finished the wad off with two hands to make sure. It was a one in a million forensic phenomenon and a call went straight through to the hardworking detectives. It was pretty good because we'd done so much work and to finally get a match of who she was, then the boyfriend and then to say there's a fingerprint and it's a match, it was just fantastic. It was the best thing we've had in months. So we could then go on to our next stages of finding him. 
From the inquiries with the Immigration Department, we knew that Richard had left the country and gone via Bangkok under his own name and passport. And White had actually booked his tickets to travel overseas on the 31st of December, which was the first business date that he could have booked the tickets after the body was located. At that point, we'd been able to establish that Richard had travelled by the Philippines and had gone to England, but where, we weren't sure. Richard White's movements on leaving Australia had been tracked, and police were confident he was now in the United Kingdom. But to continue their hunt, police would need to call on the help of their British counterparts at Scotland Yard. We received a fax from the Australian High Commission in London asking for assistance to trace a Richard White who was suspected of murdering a female called Vivian Ruiz in Sydney in December 1991. And how long are you going to be away for? We managed to do a check on the phone records of the White family in Bexley. There were a number of reverse charges phone calls to England and we provided the Metropolitan Police with those phone numbers, most of which came to uh, phone boxes in the southwest of England, but there was a phone number there for Newcastle, and we established this was actually an uncle's address. We just couldn't knock on the door. So we then made a few inquiries around bars. We found that White used to like to go to clubs and bars, so we went around and made a few inquiries there. And I actually showed a photograph of White to a barmaid, and she says, he's Australian, isn't he? And then I was sure he was definitely there. So I came up with the idea that we'd put a phone call into White's aunts and uncles, and I got this rather husky-voiced lady detective to ring up and ask, is Richard there? And said, yeah, I'm Richard. So immediately we're in through the door, and he's standing near the fireplace with a phone in his hand, and I go up to him and tell him, I've got a warrant here that's been issued by Bow Street Magistrates Court at the request of the Australian government for the murder of Vivian Ruiz. His reaction was total surprise. He said, what's happened to Vivian? I don't know anything about a murder. You can't lock me up. Well, we got the phone call to say that Richard had been arrested. Um, there was a, a fair bit of elation in the office and some relief. Uh, but oddly enough, this is actually when the hard work actually starts. The detectives needed to find further and solid proof that linked Richard White to the murder if they were to extradite him to Australia to face charges. Basically, you need to provide almost the brief that you provide for court. It's got to be of a standard in which you can actually prove a prima facie case to the English authorities of murder. Detective Sergeant Pateki asked me, look, as soon as you apprehend White, we want to go round to the parents' house and do a forensic examination of certain aspects of that house to see if Vivian's body was there at any time. We drove out to Bexley and executed the warrant immediately. We knew that White had a capacity to make a phone call and they could only delay that phone call for a short period, so he wanted to have the warrant executed and the premises secured before that phone call could be made. Knocking on someone's door in the middle of the night saying we've got a search warrant to search your house in relation to a murder investigation it isn't a pleasant thing to do to anyone. Richard's parents were quite uh, accommodating, allowing us in, allowing our crime scene fellow to come in. I was actually struck by the parents. They were very decent people. They, they both actually asked the obvious question, what's it for? Uh, and when I told them what's to do with the murder of uh, his girlfriend, Vivian Ruiz, they both broke down and cried. I, I felt quite uncomfortable about the fact that, you know, we had distressed them, but uh, the reality was we had a job to do. While the crime scene examiners looked for the evidence they needed, Richard White was in a cell in London preparing his own case. There were some notes that he made, don't talk to the police, don't be tricked by the police, and I think the last point was don't fuck up. Police are seeking the extradition of a man charged with murdering the mysterious Sydney woman known until now as Jane Doe. In their determination to identify the victim, police exhibited a mannequin and circulated a computer-enhanced photo of the woman's face. After four months of exhaustive inquiries, a Sydney prostitute would finally recognise the victim as 22-year-old Vivian Linda Ruiz. Known on the streets as Linda, Vivian had been working at King's Cross for more than six months as a stripper at various establishments, including the well-known Porky's Night Spot. 
real, real good sort. That, that's the only way I could put it. Real good sort of pleasant girl. White appeared in court today in the same clothes he was arrested in more than a week ago. The court was told police had denied him access to his clothing, cash and other belongings. A Scotland Yard detective said the clothes could not be handed over. They'd have to go to Sydney for forensic testing. During that search, we found a, what I would describe as a ligature, a cord, which had, was knotted at both ends. It was about 36 inches long. We bagged that up for the attention of the Australian authorities. Authorities here are still waiting for evidence from Sydney police to proceed with the case against White. Sydney detectives will have to prove a case against him if he's to be extradited to face the charge of murdering King's Cross stripper Vivianne Ruiz. While detectives on different sides of the world worked on her case, Vivian Ruiz was finally cremated five months after her death. Sadly, cemetery staff outnumbered the mourners. But Vivian's memory would soon be honoured by detectives determined to convict her killer. The search warrant actually revealed a number of interesting things. The house itself is built onto a, a, a slope, so there's a workroom underneath. And the workroom was fairly clearly where Richard used to do his French polishing. And it was during the search of that workshop area that a German shepherd walked through. We knew that there were some dog hairs had been found on Vivian's body. The crime scene fell at the time, with my assistance, obtained some hairs from the dog. When the police, uh, the second time around, came with hair samples of a dog, which was a German Shepherd dog, they uh, wanted me to have a look at those hairs and see whether they're identical to the hairs that I've identified. And, and they, they looked exactly the same. I felt sure, actually, that they would have come from the same dog. Sand had also been found on the victim's bodysuit when she was brought into the morgue. Where the storage room finished, there was a, a void area that was quite sandy. We noticed that it had been covered quite significantly in lime, which suggested that that might have been where the body, in fact, had been stored for a period. And also of interest was some evidence of mummification. There was a drying out at the end of the fingers, which suggested that she'd been stored somewhere and that that particular location would have been dry, it would have been well aired. Because we're talking about the middle of summer here, so, you know, it would have been somewhere where this body could have actually been left without attracting a lot of attention. In that same area, a number of boxes were piled up. Boxes that contained personal items of Vivian Ruiz. In Richard's room, there were a number of Vivian's items which would not be explained had they've had a breakup, as he'd told a number of friends that she'd gone overseas without him. One of our key witnesses was a, an associate of both Richard and Vivian, and he'd bumped into Richard on New Year's Eve, shortly after the murder, and in fact had asked Richard where Vivian was because he was a mutual friend of both. The interesting thing was that Richard made a point of saying very specifically that they'd, that they'd both broken up, that he had cashed in his ticket to go overseas and that Vivian was still planning to go overseas without him. So it didn't make sense that she'd leave these items there, and certainly it suggested that he was actually building an alibi and building a story to all his friends that uh, Vivian had gone overseas and therefore it was not untoward to, to see that she was missing. Police are confident the man charged over Sydney's so-called Jane Doe murder will be extradited from Britain within a fortnight. White's solicitor has just returned after visiting her client and says he now wants to come home. He, he's quite keen that he wants to clear his name. The detectives then headed to London. We went to the uh, watch house and there was a search of the material that he had on him. There was a whole set of notes basically addressed to himself about things he needed to say and things he needed to cover. And there was one note headed, do this now, and the, uh, the first point was uh, convince yourself of your innocence. In a way, sort of saying that he, he's guilty because um, convince yourself of your innocence. If you're innocent, you don't have to convince yourself. Then uh, went on with a, a series of points underneath, which uh, included contact your business associates and friends, convince them of your innocence. Don't talk to the police. Don't be tricked by the police. And I, I think the last point was don't fuck up. He then went on in a, another series of notes to actually have what appeared to be a mock interview. 
they'd had things like a question, why did I hit her? Then a series of answers after it. And, and it appeared to me that he very clearly at this point was trying to actually work out, okay, well, what's, a, what's a valid story I can put to the court that I'll believe that says I didn't kill her? The reason for those notes appeared to be as a result of a conversation he had with Detective Bowen on the flight from Newcastle to London just after his arrest. Richard White said, I have to fight this. She told me on Christmas Eve that she was a prostitute. I just thought she was a dancer. She told me that she couldn't come to my parents' place. We had a fight. I felt so stupid. It's not as bad as the same. Yet other of his notes and statements from friends of the couple were in complete contradiction to this account. When Les tells me about this, clearly, you know, we've actually got to really nut down this relationship in terms of what people understood their relationship was. And it was fairly clear that the picture was that a number of people knew that Richard and Vivian were in a relationship where he knew she was a prostitute and was turned on by it. I think it, it clearly demonstrates that this guy has a, a degree of cunning. He's clearly running a line that, you know, she's a prostitute and that that opens a, a door for him in terms of actually explaining why she's been killed. That may, you know, allow him to, 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 to find a, an excuse that, that, that exonerates him. Richard George White arrived back in Australia under police guard last night following lengthy extradition proceedings in Britain. Today, Central Local Court was told Ms Ruiz died from strangulation and suffocation sometime on December 24, three days before her body was found wrapped in plastic garbage bags. Police indicated their case against White would feature detailed scientific evidence, including the allegation his fingerprint was found on the newspaper stuffed in the victim's throat and that her blood was found in the car he sold before leaving for England. But the case for the defence was about to throw a spanner in the works. It may be Richard's print, but not Vivian's blood. It was a theory that could set Richard White free. Two years after Vivian Ruiz was murdered, the police felt they had a strong brief of evidence to present at Richard White's committal. But it wasn't a fait accompli. The court situation, it can twist and turn and technicalities arise and we lose cases. Fingerprints have lost a lot of cases. But in this case, it wasn't the fingerprint that was going to be questioned, but how it got there. His defence team believed that Richard, more so his fingerprint, had accidentally been caught up in the murder. And he was never there. We were always convinced that the fingerprint was our key item of evidence. It was everything else hinged around that. But because we had such a small sample on the newspaper, we couldn't submit it for any further testing in terms of confirming whether it was blood or not. It was critical evidence to the fingerprint people. Until we got the clearest possible image, we didn't even touch it with a chemical, let alone test it for blood. Once fingerprinting was completed, they then sent the newspaper to me. So I just tested the prints with a screening test for blood. This is a catalytic test and it isn't specific for blood, but it will give a good indication if blood is present. And I got a positive reaction for the prints. But the test will show positive for anything that is protein-based, like meat. It was a fact that the defence was eager to act on. And during the course of a, a cross-examination of Barry Fay, the defence made this very strong suggestion that said that, look, their client could simply have been the victim of circumstance. She theorised that perhaps her client was, could have been eating a meat pie with tomato sauce on it at the time that fingerprint was placed on the newspaper. He's eating that pie with sauce while reading a newspaper. He's left a print on the newspaper. And that at some point down the track, quite independent from him, the real offender has come in, killed Vivian Ruiz, picked up this newspaper, screwed it up, forced it down her throat, and incriminated their client by the fact that they've left this pie sauce fingerprint in the newspaper. And then Detective Plotecki saved the day by rushing off and getting a copy of that newspaper, and we found that if that was the case, it was a meat pie, then he had to be reading the newspaper upside down. 
it was fairly clear the defence didn't have a response for this and, and actually hadn't thought with any clarity about where this fingerprint was actually found. And then Barry went on to sort of hammer home the nail by actually saying it's not just a case of, you know, touching the paper. This is this is sub substantial force. The pressure of that last thrust transferred the valleys onto the paper and the closing up of the jaw sealed it off for all time. And I think that's the compelling argument on which the rest of the brief hangs, is that the person who scrunches up that paper must have been the person who leaves that print there. That put his hand down her throat. Why do you put your hand down someone's throat? The average layman's going to be thinking, well, to kill someone. As soon as that point was made in that committal, I knew at the, uh, at the trial we would have this matter dusted. There was enough circumstance in our mind to um, bring a, a jury to a guilty conviction. After four years, an international hunt and some meticulous forensic work, the mystery of the Jane Doe murder has finally been solved. A Sydney man was today convicted of killing prostitute Vivian Ruiz, the real identity of the victim. Judge Hidden said White's admissions to British police on his arrest and his fingerprint on newspaper found down the victim's throat left no doubt he was the killer. The judge found White had killed his girlfriend in a fit of passion, but just what triggered the gruesome attack will probably never be known. There are obviously unresolved issues, and they happen in every murder inquiry. And in this one, one of the unresolved issues is where was she murdered? We also really haven't nutted out the motive. While I have a theory that I believe that the steroids and the, the speed abuse contributed to this murder, I think there's a degree of premeditation in it. I think that uh, he was contemplating this notion of actually getting rid of for some time based on the fact that he's taken the money, which is a very conscious act. But the fact is we don't know for sure, and the only person who can tell us is White. My belief is Richard's probably hit her with a stunning blow to the back of the head and then strangled her. Chances are he thought she's alive and finished her off by shoving this newspaper down her throat. I suspect, based on the fact there's lime under the parent's household, that he's actually placed the body up in a very cool area. He has probably left it there for a short period over the Christmas break. Wrapped the body up in plastic, taken it out, put it in the van. It was certainly the case we could say there were trace elements of blood on the differential cover in the back cargo area of that van, which would suggest this was a vehicle used to transport Vivian to Guess Avenue where the body was dumped. Richard White was sentenced to 15 years with a minimum of 10 for murdering his girlfriend, Vivian Ruiz. He is still serving time. I was quite pleased and quite proud that we were involved in this process because it had been a lot of investment, both emotionally and professionally. And I think the key thing for any cop is that you join to make a difference. And when you look at this case, it could be one that is still sitting on the shelf if we hadn't have actually pushed it that little bit. The Jane Doe murder mystery will stay in the annals of the fingerprint science in New South Wales for a thousand years. It'll be referred to over and over whenever a tonal reverse comes about, and it'll happen again and again. <laughs>